it, Eric. Good morning, and welcome to worship. It's good to be with you again. I thought when they, when Pastor asked about the 29th of August, that was such a long ways away, and here we are. It goes fast, but it's good to be with you, and I noticed the sun is coming out, which is great for the next service, and the sun is always shining when we're together for worship anyway, so we thank God for this day of worship. Let me call your attention to a couple of announcements. Uh, this is the last week for you to purchase your chicken queue tickets. I assume you know what that means. And so please do that. They are available today and until September 2nd. And then also next week, worship is going to be at Winona Lake Park, uh, Banchell, and that's at 9.30, and there also will be the online uh, service as well. This week at 7 o'clock, conferments meet as we anticipate the fall schedule. And so um, this is a good time for us as we gather again to be educated, to uh, worship, uh, to come together. So if you're a visitor who's here with us this morning, a special welcome to you, and we uh, would encourage you to come back and worship with us again. Thank you. We'll sing the opening hymn. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, and the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life. And feed us life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. 
By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are showing, we, you are showing God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Deuteronomy. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add to or what I command, nor take anything away from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discern in discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as to neither forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel from Mark, the seventh chapter. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of the disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, the pe this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that, is going, that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. 
And I, you can be seated, and I would invite the children to come up. And I must say, I am impressed. I have seen you coming in with your backpacks. You obviously got the memo. Come on up. This is the beginning of an exciting time, I know. Here comes John to assist. You can sit, sit over on this side, if you would, because I want to... Oh, my. Can you kind of sit around so that you can see what I'm going to do? Because we, before we do the backpacks, mm -hmm. I have something else that I want to tell you. There. Oh, can you, oh, can, will you be able to see? Okay. Why don't you come up? Can you sit on the floor in front? Okay. Now, we're talking today about, in the Bible, there were a lot of traditions. And these traditions um, be, were very important to people. And I wanted to tell you about a tradition. I love to go to Tanzania, Africa, and visit my friends. And I know that Tanzania is very dear to the heart of this congregation as well. And so I was going to tell you one of the traditions there. Now, it comes from a time when they used to use their hands to eat because they didn't have forks. And not everyone uses a fork even today. But what they do before the meal is they wash your hands. So could I have a volunteer to help me? OK, why don't you come up? OK. And so I will, what, this is what they do. Hold your hands over the water. And we're going to get your scrunchie there. OK, and then you need the soap. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, kind of lather up a little bit. Now, this, while this was for a purpose, and, and now, and then hold it over the water again. And while this was for a purpose, now they do it as a part of their hospitality. So when you're a guest, they treat you so well by doing that. Here's some to wash your hands off. Now, I had envisioned that I was going to wash everybody's hands, but that would take a little too long the way it looks. But this is an, thank you, this is an important tradition for them. Another kind of a neat tradition is before it's the meal, when it's time to eat, it's the cook who always says the prayer. Not because they're not a good cook, but they just say the prayer because that is another one of their traditions. So in tr traditions, the reason they do it is to make you now, to make you feel welcome. Well, I hope you feel welcome today at church. I hope you feel welcome when you come into this building because you are really important to this congregation. You probably got up this morning and you see John shaking his head. You probably got up this morning and you said, oh, I'm going to church. And you thought you were doing that for your parents or somebody, but you are doing that for all of these people because when you come here, you make them so happy. Now, I know that you are going to be going to school. And when you go to school, you are going to take your backpacks. And you see, I see everybody brought yours. Some really pretty ones, too. Are they, many of them are new. Is somebody going to use the same one from last year because it just didn't wear out? Oh, good, good idea. OK, and this really isn't the backpack. I send backpacks down to Mexico. And so one of them is going to get a backpack that has a special little, what, what would you call this? Cross. It's a little, it's a cross. And what does it say? Can you tell me? Does somebody know what it says? It says, yes, it says, made in God's image. That's you. You were made in God's image. And so look at that. You're going to have one of these on your backpack. Now, is, is everybody excited about going to school? Yeah? Yeah? Do you ever get that feeling in your stomach like 
some butterflies, maybe a little bit nervous about it. I used to always do that. So, yeah, some of you do. Well, if you do, you remember that your church loves you and your God loves you and you're not alone. Now, one of the things I'm going to ask all of these people is if they will pray for you. Isn't that nice when you're prayed for? You know how good that feels? Should I ask them if they'll do that? Okay. Will you pray for these children and all the other children who are going to school that they will be safe, that they will learn, that they'll have fun? We should pray that too, shouldn't we? That you will have fun as well. Well, they're going to pray. Did, did you shake your heads? Okay, okay. I forgot. I forgot if they shook their heads or not. Yeah, they were shaking their heads. So they are going to be praying for you because they want you to know that you're not alone, that Jesus is with you. And this is a reminder of that. So I'm going to say a little prayer, and then we are going to give you one of these. And thank you so much for coming. That is wonderful. Let us pray. God, thank you for loving us and for promising to be with us. Watch over these boys and girls as they go to school and all of the children in school. We know how much you love them. Amen. Okay, so would you want to help pass those out? Yeah, they're, they're right by you. Can you kind of give them one to everybody? Here, you come over here. Okay, yeah. Good. Kind of pass them out. Why don't you come up here, and then you can get one. Yeah, you help. Okay, there you go. And if you know of anybody else at once, when we have plenty, right, Sean? Uh, you got that. We have plenty. If you know of anybody else who wants one, or somebody who isn't here today that wants one for their backpack, okay, that would be fine. Oh. I, well, I bet John can help you. She wonders how you put it on. Oh, yeah. So um, that's an important part of this whole thing. I didn't even tell you that. I hope your arm gets better. Did your surgery go well? Okay, you got two. Are they sticking together? Okay, everybody got one? Thank you very, very much. And thank you for helping, John. Oh, you couldn't do it, huh? But I oh. did get one for myself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ludafisk. I I don't love it. I like Ludafisk. Actually, I love the taste of butter. I love lefsa, and I eat lutefisk because it's a family tradition. My family sings a goofy song about lutefisk, and we complain about the way it smells, and then most of us eat it. We do it because it is a fun family tradition. Tradition is a powerful force in our lives. That is true of families. It's also true of society. Traditions give us our identity and to a certain extent set borders on our behaviors. They inform who we are. For the Jews, tradition was always very important. They viewed themselves as set, off, as set apart by God as a holy people for a holy purpose. And their traditions helped them remain and maintain their identity in what was often a hostile world. You may remember a wonderful line that Tevier speaks in Fiddler on the Roof about tradition. He says, you may ask, why do we practice these traditions? Well, I'll tell you, I don't know, but they're tradition. Tevier is the head of a family living in a small village in Russia. He continually struggles with traditions and values. 
in a small village, there are traditions for everything, how to eat, how to sleep, what to wear. For instance, they always kept their heads covered and always wore a small prayer shawl as a sign of their constant devotion to God. And when the sun went down on Friday until, mid, until nightfall on Saturday, they worshiped and refrained from working because God rested on the seventh day. They knew her, who they were and what God expected them to do. Tevier was molded by his obedience to tradition, but he was not a rigid man. He had the capacity to compromise until he was pushed too far. That's what happened when his last daughter asked him to approve of her marriage to an atheist. This was too much for Tevier, and he loudly declares, some things I will not, I cannot allow, tradition. Certainly, traditions were important to the Jews, considering the persecution of the Jewish community throughout history, it is doubtful that they would have survived without the help of tradition. Maybe that is why uh, some of us have started to reclaim some of our family traditions. However, tradition can get out of hand. That's what happened with the Pharisees, I believe. For example, eating with unclean hands was considered to be a greater offense than how you, how you, uh, how you were treated your, your next door neighbor. How wrong can, is that? The tradition had taken over religion, and that sets the stage for our scripture lesson today. In our scripture reading, a delegation of religious people came from Jerusalem to follow Jesus around and scrutinize his teachings and behaviors. It was something that they had done before, you will remember, but recently they called Jesus an instrument of the devil. And this time they noticed that some of Jesus' disciples were eating food without first washing their hands. Now, this might seem like a hygiene issue to you, which it is, of course. That's why we remind children and over and over again to wash their hands before they eat. Parents are hoping by saying it often enough that one day it'll become a habit and they will do it on their own. But it must be repeated many times, right, parents? COVID has reminded us of just how important it is for us to wash our hands. We know that like the disciples, not everybody does it. And that is why there are signs in the restrooms reminding people to wash their hands before they return to work. We don't all do what we're supposed to do. But to the Pharisees, devoted Jews, washing one's hands was more than hygiene, it was a tradition. It was a ceremonial washing, not only of hands, but cups and pitchers and kettles. The tradition, I expect, grew out of a need for good hygiene, but now it had become more than one of more than 900 plus laws that the Pharisees observed. And so they asked Jesus, what is wrong with your disciples? Why don't they live according to the tra tradition of the elders? Well, the gospel writer of Mark, whose target was the Romans, by the way, explains for his readers that washing, this washing was not a pre-surgical scrub when they washed their hands. No, they merely poured some water over their hands and then dried them with a the cloth in order to meet the requirement of the law. And a, a tradition that had been passed down from one generation to another for perhaps a thousand years. But here comes the important part. More than likely, the religious leaders who confront Jesus that day had to pass through a large marketplace in order to get to where Jesus was. In the marketplace, they were all kinds of people with all kinds of needs. 
but the Pharisees were blind to the needs of the people that they passed that day. Rather, what concerned them about the marketplace was that they had con come in contact with Gentiles, non-Jews. This contact with non-Jews would make them ritually unclean. And so before they could be considered acceptable in the eyes of God once again, they had to wash away those Gentile germs in a ritual cleaning. We are Gentiles, of course, and once we were on the outside, once we were discriminated against because of our ethnic origins, shouldn't that make us more or less likely to discriminate against others? Just a thought. Jesus' exchange with the Pharisees that day uh, was a bit harsh, I would say. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor the, me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are mere human rules. They have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human tradition. Some strong words from Jesus. But let's put those in context. Jesus had just come from Gennesaret, where Mark says, every place that Jesus went, the sick were brought to him to be healed. He was surrounded by such great human need. People begged to touch the edge of his robe, and all who touched it, Mark said, were healed. Is it any wonder that Jesus was a little angry at the Pharisees, who only seemed to care so little about uh, that human need that Jesus saw so much of. The Pharisees seemed so, to so easily dismiss the diseased and the disabled. But according to Pharisaic law, these people were considered to be ritually unclean. That meant that they were barred from worship. They were barred from offering sacrifices or even worshiping in the temple. They were considered, considered unacceptable through no fault of their own and therefore unclean in the sight of the church of that day. And sadly, more importantly, they were told that they were unacceptable, unclean in the sight of God. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can make them unclean by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that makes them unclean. We like to focus on what is on the outside, thinking that it's the same as what is on the inside. A father opens the door to greet his daughter's date. There stands a young man, his cap is on backward, his jeans sag practically to his knees, a diamond stud in his lower lip, and hearing and wearing a set of earphones. The young man grunts a hello and walks in. The father is more than a little taken aback. He goes upstairs where his daughter is getting ready for putting the finishing touches on her makeup I don't think you should go out with that young man, the father says. He doesn't look like a nice person. Oh, the, the daughter is shocked. Daddy, she says, if he wasn't such a nice person, why would he be doing 500 hours of community service? <laughs> we look at the outside deter to determine how, what, if it is a good person or a bad person. We like to judge by appearance. As a child, I had one Sunday dress. Everyone dressed up for church in those days. I remember when my brother got married that his wife wore jeans to church. Nice jeans, but jeans nevertheless. It was probably 40 years ago now, and a lot has changed since that. But boy, it caused 
quite a stir in that small country church. No one could understand it. Jeans in church? And I remember my parents defending her and reminding the people that it was more important that she was there than what she was wearing. And eventually they got to know and love Shar, and they looked past the jeans to see the person. It might still be a little difficult today for those of us who were raised with one Sunday dress to look past the clothes to the person, but we've made huge strides in doing that, haven't we? Now, I expect that the Pharisees looked very good on the outside. They were good people and a lot like you and me. They wanted rules set in concrete to follow. They wanted to know what the boundaries were. They wanted to know it, that these people are bad and these people are good. These people are acceptable. These people are non-accept, unacceptable. These people are considered clean by the church and these people unclean. They drew li lines and we attempt to draw lines as well. Legalism comes in many forms and is alive and well. There are some, and even Christians, who would draw a line that excludes certain people, gays or transgendered folks. We may draw a line that, that excludes people who voted for Biden or people who voted for Trump, people on the left and people on the right, people who wear a crew cut and those who wear dreadlocks. Who is in and who is out? who is acceptable and who is unacceptable, and therefore, we assume, unacceptable to God. But legalistic formulas didn't work in Jesus' day, and they don't work in ours either. We know that we can get all dressed up and look really good on the outside. We can even deceive ourselves into believing that we are one of the good ones. We can surround ourselves with people who look and act like we do. But according to Jesus, the problem isn't what goes into us. The problem isn't with the outside. It is with what's on the inside and what comes out of us. We can wash our hands faithfully, but it is what on, is on the inside that defiles us. It is called original sin. Original sin is that sinful condition that we have inherited. It has come to us through no fault of our own. We are all unclean, equally sinful, and that is in the words of Paul, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I remember trying to go through a day without sinning. I felt so guilty about my sin and always wanted to do everything right. I remembered that I would try. I was helped by a plaque once that somebody gave me, on, and on that plaque it was talked about a person who was having a sinless day. But then it says, but I'm going to get out of bed now. <laughs> The truth is that we would be in trouble even if we stay in bed because we have to confess not only what we have done, but what we have left undone. We confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. That's what our confession says. In Romans 7, Paul talks about this experience of original sin in this way. I want to do good, but I can't. I don't want to do evil, but I find myself doing it. Paul says it is the power of sin that keeps sabotaging his best intentions. Something has gone wrong within him. He's talking about original sin. And then he asks the question, who will deliver me from this sinful nature? The answer, of course, is Jesus Christ. He not only can, but he did. 
Jesus entered into our human condition, took on our humanity in order to set it right. He took on our sin, and in forgiveness we are set free. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can make us acceptable to God, and he did it through his death. Only Jesus has the power to change what is on the inside. Jesus, then, is the great restorer. We have been made whole through the gift of forgiveness. Christ has done for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. So, whether you wash your hands before you eat, whether you dress up to go to church or wear old jeans, whether you like hymns or rock music, whether you sit like a statue in church or shout alleluia, whether you know how to read the Bible or how to act in the ways of church people, none of that matters to God. What matters to God is you, and so do all people. God, God loves uh, sinners in Jesus Christ. Thank goodness for that. No. Thank God for that. Amen. Please stand. Living together in trust and hope, we are bold to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church that is a safe haven for all who seek your presence. Fill it with leaders who echo your expansive and generous welcome. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole of creation, that plants and animals have the habitat and resources to thrive and flourish. Inspire us to protect threatened habitats and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for individuals in positions of authority. Raise up wise and discerning leaders in federal, state, and local governments and guide them to seek the benefit of every person. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, especially those beginning a new school year, empower teachers and school administrators 
guide students in their learning and development, accompany parents, foster parents, and caregivers who provide encouragement and love. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless all who are in need. Accompany all who suffer, especially Linda, Alicia, Lisa, Debbie, Steve, Ella, Arlene, Tim, Bob, Carolyn, James, Jeff, Janice, Dennis, Pam, Sonia, Karen, Ken, Linda, Rod, C, Tanya, Susan, Donna, Alexis, the family of Neil Shea Hester. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophet, and at the end of the ages, the gift of your son who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's table is prepared. You may be seated.
brother in Christ shed for you. 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 Shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever.
peace. You are the body of Christ.